there was no way in hell I would have been capable of forgiving both my mother and my father had I not done the preliminary work I needed to do personally around the trauma that I was carrying. Trauma blocks love, love heals trauma. I believe we have to heal from our trauma before we can entertain this idea of forgiveness. I'll tell you more about that as we go through our time together today. But those are some of my thoughts and views right off the bat. And let's dive in here. <clears throat> I've already kind of mentioned trauma blocks love, love heals trauma. <clears throat> I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna add it's the forgiveness dimension to this. Here's where I would, if you can see my pointer, trauma blocks love, love heals trauma. And then I would put after healing equals forgiveness after healing equals forgiveness right so when we think about forgiveness when we think about this activating word right <clears throat> people get really stirred up around it people feel pressure around it people feel they're less than or inadequate if they choose not to and i really want to dispel that belief that it has to happen again forced or suggested prematurely a bypass to avoid suffering can be done in isolation this is one of the things that i think was a surprise to me that you don't need to engage with the perpetrator in order to forgive them you don't need to be in relationship with this person who harmed you in order to forgive them so it can be done on your own because remember i said it's about you not about them it can be religious or spiritually based a second dimension of healing which i talked about you know how people talk about post-traumatic growth right growth after trauma i like to think about forgiveness is post healing growth we get traumatized after we traumatize, we need to heal. After we heal, we can think about forgiveness. That's the way I think about that cycle. Okay. <clears throat> the overall components of forgiveness. Um, first, there's an acknowledgement that harm has been done, right? Before we rush to release it or let go of it or forgive the person, we have to be able to acknowledge the harm that was done, okay? This happened to me. This exists. I acknowledge it. I had a very powerful um, experience with my mother yesterday while I was in Chicago. Um, I write, I'm gonna read a passage from the book about a piece of forgiveness that I did with my father and I had a huge dimension of forgiveness with my mother that I was surprised about yesterday. And the thing that was interesting about it relative to acknowledging harm was that for most of my life, it was too complicated. I get emotional just thinking about revisiting this. It was too complicated for my mother, for all of the reasons that were about her, to acknowledge the harm that was bestowed upon me, her son, who she loves dearly, because she had such a strong attachment to my father, my primary abuser. So my mother struggled with acknowledging the harm because of the need of her connection with my father, right? The harm to me relative to the connection she needed to my father. And it was only yesterday for the first time in our lives together that my mother was able to acknowledge, yes, Frank, you have been harmed. You had a traumatic childhood. 
And yes, Frank, I love my husband. It was the first time she was ever able to do that, right? And I said to her, mom, is it possible to hold both, right? And she was able to do that at 84 years of age, right? People are capable of changing at any stage of their life. The reason that I bring this up was that I didn't need her to be able to acknowledge the harm that was done to me in order for me to forgive her. I'm gonna say that again, because I think it's really important. I didn't need her to acknowledge the harm that was done to me in order for me to be able to forgive her. Okay, I've, I, through my forgiveness journey with my mom and with my dad, I learned to hold the complexities and the limitations of both of them while being able to love them because that was about them and not about me. But the only way I was truly able to hold that position, holding my truth in the midst of their belief system was by doing my own healing work first. 10 years ago, I wasn't capable of holding my truth in the context of somebody else having a different view, right? Holding my steadiness, my confidence, my truth in the midst of somebody else, someone in power, someone who I love, having a different view. So this acknowledgement of harm done is an important piece of the forgiveness process. And not only is it an acknowledgement of the harm done, it's also acceptance of the pain and the feelings, it should say, and the physical sensations associated with the harm. That's where the healing comes in, right? We've got to be able to be with the thoughts, the feelings, the physical sensations, the pain associated with the harm in order to be able to forgive. Letting go of the anger and resentment of what we feel towards the person who harmed us is very different than it letting go of the pain, the hurt, the thoughts, the distorted beliefs we carry about the trauma. I'm going to say that one again. Letting go of the anger and resentment that we feel toward the person who harmed us is different than the process of letting go of the thoughts, the feelings, and the physical sensations we hold relative to the trauma, because that's more about us. I'm bad, I'm wrong, it was my fault. I'm overwhelmed with trauma feelings, I'm gonna die, um, I'm gonna be um, destroyed, I don't, ex I don't, I'm unloved, I'm unworthy, or whatever physical sensations, right? I hope you're starting to see the difference between healing trauma and forgiving the person who harmed you. Two totally different things. We shouldn't lump them together. <clears throat> this issue is a big one um, that I'm gonna share with people and we're gonna talk more about later. I'm just gonna mention it now is, can you access or develop empathy and compassion for the person who has harmed you? Empathy and compassion for the person who's harmed you. That's tricky also. Some people get really activated by me mentioning this, but we're going to talk more about this moving forward also. Then there's this separate issue around the process that you have for forgiveness around someone who harmed you is committing to a choice of whether or not you want reconciliation. Because you can forgive without having reconciliation, right? You can forgive somebody without needing to reconcile 
You can forgive somebody and still choose to not have a connection or a relationship with them. You can forgive somebody and choose to have a connection and a relationship with them. But those are separate issues too. We wanna to break this all down, right? And then we move forward with choice and in a different kind of way. Okay, forgiveness as a choice. <clears throat> some people don't need to, some people don't want to. Some people don't get a chance to. And this is something that I think is really complicated. I was so lucky at the end of my father's life and I really do see the opportunity for forgiveness as a gift because it was a true gift for me. It was a surprise. I wasn't expecting. I didn't think I needed. I didn't, I wasn't even striving for it, but it ended up being a gift that showed up for me personally. It may include confrontation. Okay. Forgiveness is not only about feeling empathy and compassion for someone who has harmed you. Forgiveness is not only about releasing the anger and resentment you carry towards them. Forgiveness may include what you need to say to the other person, not what they need to hear. Forgiveness is about what you need to say, potentially, not what they need to hear, because we have no control over what somebody else hears. We have control over what we say, right? And then you might choose to have ongoing connection. You may not choose to have ongoing connection based on how they respond to your reconciliation, to your confrontation, if you choose to do that, to your releasing the feelings you carry towards them. You can choose at any point in time to continue to have an ongoing connection or not or not. <clears throat> Different models of forgiveness, as I mentioned before. One of the models of forgiveness, and we're going to go over this, is Desmond um, and um, fo two fo two Tutu's. I always don't know how to say, this is his daughter. So Desmond Tutu and his daughter, I'm not quite sure how to say her name. So it's probably better that I don't. Um, so I don't say it in the wrong way. Um, have a four path model towards healing ourselves and the world around forgiveness. And I just think it's a beautiful model. They worked on this in regards to apartheid in South Africa. Um, they had people, perpetrators and victims come together and discuss this issue of forgiveness. They had the victims of apartheid tell their trauma stories to the perpetrators very powerful exchanges and interactions. We're gonna go over his four fourfold path for healing. I think it's beautiful and it shows the steps of healing independent of trauma healing. Jack Cornfield has an art of forgiveness, loving kindness. A lot of meditative practices include meta or loving kindness as it relates to forgiveness. Robert Enright has a model <clears throat> um, himself called the four phases of forgiveness. Worthington's reach model for forgiveness. Um, R.D. Lang has a transcendence model of forgiveness. And again, there are psychological models for forgiveness and there are spiritual and religious models of forgiveness also. Here we are from a spiritual, religious, Christianity, Buddhism model. Like, I think it's important to kind of break these down a little bit because all forgiveness should not be treated the same depending on from what place you're looking at it from, right? Spirit, in, when, from a spiritual perspective, if we think about spirituality, right? Um, we're looking at recognizing a higher power and the higher power can help us in letting go of what we're carrying, anger, resentment, or bitterment, bitterness towards oneself and others. That's a very important point here. I wanna to highlight towards oneself or others because we're gonna talk about 
in our second hour together here, is it, are we really capable of forgiving someone else without forgiving ourselves? I can also say it in the reverse order. Are we capable of truly forgiving ourselves for what we've done if we haven't forgiven those who have harmed us? So I love that the spiritual approach includes forgiveness towards ourselves as well as towards others, right? Seen as an act of grace or mercy and compassion and allows individuals to release themselves from the negative emotions and move forward towards reconciliation. Often a two-way process from a spiritual perspective. Religious models, and you know, there's so many different religions, so I, I'm not gonna necessarily break them all down in the ways that they'll hold this understanding of forgiveness, but often for religious models, that include that incorporate forgiveness include repentance and remorse, confession or admitting wrongdoing, atonement or reparation. So often religious models are about the person harming who's involved. I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm asking for remorse. I feel sorry for what I have done. I admit wrongdoing. Like it's the person doing the harm focusing more than on the person who was harmed, right? This is, I was just watching, what was I watching? Oh, something of Bannersheen. I, I can't remember. I, I always forget the title of that. Um, Colin <clears throat> um, Firth was in that, I believe. I, I'm going to mess that up. Anyways, it's a um, um, movie that was out a couple years ago. And <clears throat> it was, they had this big scene around the confessional, right? People in specifically Catholicism, but not only, go to confession to ask for forgiveness of their sins, right? That's a model of forgiveness. Christianity, again, involves the offender and the offended, right? Both parties acknowledging one's wrongdoing, seeking forgiveness from God, as well as from the person who you hurt. Okay, two levels of forgiveness. God forgive me, Jesus forgive me, and the person who I've hurt, can you forgive me, right? Um, and the person who was hurt needs to be willing to forgive or let go of the anger as an act of grace. Buddhism, right? We're talking about letting go of negative emotions, such as anger, resentment, hatred. Here's the Here's the piece for Buddhism or meditative practices, cultivating compassion and empathy towards oneself and others, seen as an act of wisdom that enables individuals to break free from suffering and cultivating inner peace. I'll forgive you and I will have inner peace. Christianity, um, I, the, I've harmed you, so I'm asking for forgiveness. So it's important here, as you can see, which angle are we looking at here when we're talking about forgiveness? Are we looking to be forgiven for what we've done? Are we looking to forgive others who have done to us? Which dimension are you talking about? And then I, I kind of love this one, the psychotherapy model of forgiveness. I was like, I didn't even know there was a psychotherapy model for forgiveness, folks. And that when I start reading through some of the components of it, I'm like, yeah, this is what we do for a living here. Yeah, we do this for a living, right? exploring the process of your emotion, examining the beliefs and the values, exploring conflicts that arise um, in the forgiveness process, developing empathy and compassion towards oneself and others, recognizing the humanity and the fallibility in all of us, building communication skills, proactive listening, expressing needs, setting boundaries, all of these psychotherapy terms, are utilized that we talk about all the time in psychotherapy to also help people incorporate this issue of forgiving. Building resilience, supporting a, res a resilience process, mindfulness, stress reduction, and other self-care strategies. So you can see 
there are various different models here, various different orientations, various different ways to think about forgiveness, right? <clears throat> okay, let's just talk a little bit here about the harms of forgiveness, right? Let's not look at it all as like a silver lining here and everybody needs to do it because forgiveness can be harmful. It really can be harmful to people. It can lead towards healing growth and promoting improved relationships. <clears throat> um, it can be harmful when it's forced or coerced, okay? I have to tell you, I have been guilty of this. How many times have I forced my children to forgive each other? Tell your brother you're sorry. Forgive your brother for what he did to you, right? In this bad parenting moment of Frank Anderson's <laughs> way, right? We, because of our frustration and our difficulty in tolerating conflict, in tolerating difficult feelings, can push forgiveness, right? Pushing our spouse to forgive us for what we've done to them because we can't tolerate the idea and the reality and the feelings around hurting someone. If I can't tolerate the fact that I've deeply hurt you, I'm going to want you to forgive me so that I will be feeling better or absolved from my difficult feelings, right? When it's used to absolve the offender of their responsibility for their actions, when it's used to avoid confronting people with difficult emotions and issues in a relationship, right? When it perpetuates a pattern of abuse, it's important, really important to pay attention to. In fact, forgiveness can be a power differential that is forced upon someone in a way that can be harmful and perpetuate trauma. So we've got to be careful when we're thinking about it, right? One of the things, and I'll tell you more about um, the process that happened with my mother yesterday, which was, again, very powerful for me. Um, how does your family work through difficulty? Or when you're working with your clients, very important. How did your family handle anger? How did your family process emotions or did they? How did you work through adversity? My mother and I yesterday, while we were kind of holding hands and crying, she said, oh, Frankie, I wish we would have talked about this so much sooner. She said, but I'm always afraid of conflict. I've been afraid of conflict my whole life because I grew up without a father and I thought, that if anybody was mad at me, they would leave me and I'd be all alone. Just broke my heart, right? Broke my heart, I was like, oh, mom, I totally get that. I'm afraid of conflict too. I was totally terrified that if I hurt or disappoint somebody, they would yell and scream at me and then I would be all alone, right? So this issue of avoiding tough conversations, doesn't allow us to move through to get to the point of forgiveness or not when we can't have difficult conversations. Was there a lot of yelling and screaming? Did people just shut down and not say anything, right? What was your experience with anger or revenge or confrontation? Did it include punishing? Was your model of anger attacking and mean and punishing? Was your model for dealing with anger around empowerment and setting boundaries and being able to say no when something doesn't feel correct? How did your family handle grief and loss? Huge, because it's a big component of forgiveness, right? <clears throat> How did they handle loss? Okay, um, what, let's do this. I'm gonna stop for a moment before we talk about the different types of trauma and dive into forgiveness a little bit more. Maddie, I wonder if we have 
any questions and I don't know if you want me to just look through the Q and A or <clears throat> you're wanting um, me to go through the list. Do you have a sense of that, Maddie? Yeah, we have lots of questions so far. And um, if you open the Q&A, you should be able to go through and, and see some of the most upvoted ones. Okay, perfect. I will do that. Okay. Okay, so this is Ann Parks is asking a question. How does one forgive when the spouse was abusive because of their own struggle with sexual orientation? Oh my goodness, Ann. You're talking about my story right here. I like I have a friend, her name is Anne, and she's asking a question. Okay, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. <clears throat> How does one forgive when a spouse was abusive because of their own struggle with sexual orientation, as my clients would say knowingly, prevented her from having healthy relationships because of her husband's abuse? So thank you for that question, Anne. Here's what I will say about that one, because I lived it. Um, one of the things that happened for me, and you can read about this in To Be Loved if you're interested or not, is I grew up and I started therapy at six years old, and I was in a form of conversion therapy because I got caught playing with a Barbie doll at a very early age. Back in the day, folks, being gay was a disorder. So I was sent to therapy for six years and I was learning how to not be myself. I was learning how to act like a normal boy, right? I used to watch my uncles say, how are they acting? How, how that's the way a man is supposed to be, right? So having said that, Anne, I got married to a woman, okay? I knew that was the right thing to do. That's what I was supposed to do. So I did. I married a woman. What ended up happening, and I was able to do that, right? I was able to march through and I did the right things and found this woman and married her. She was a good friend of mine. We were chemistry lab partners. What ended up happening, Anne, is that I ended up recreating my father's behavior with my then wife, okay? I became controlling, at times verbally abusive, and I married someone who was passive and accommodating, just like my mother. I became my father. She became my mother. Now, what I will say is that, yes, I <clears throat> was suppressing my sexuality. And was I taking my anger and frustration out at her? Absolutely. In a way, do I feel bad about that today? 100%, right? She didn't need to be the recipient of my disconnection, my repression of my sexuality. Um, so I do hold a lot of remorse around that to this day. It was also interesting for me is that she ended up marrying me because of her own issues with intimacy and sexuality totally independent of her orientation i was a safe person for her she was a safe person for me so we co-created dysfunction in a way now i i take responsibility for my piece of that for sure and you know her and i have talked about what that was like for her why my limited ability to be emotionally available was acceptable to her at the time based on what she was dealing with and what I projected onto her because I couldn't tolerate who I was and I wasn't honest enough with myself or with her. So I think there is a process there and I think it takes two people to be able and willing to discuss that. Now, <clears throat> One of the things, and if you're talking about a client who's, a, you know, somebody who's trying to forgive their partner for being abusive to them, there is a way of differentiating what is mine here, what is my contribution, and really what is the other person's. So I would try to help your client, if that's who you're talking about, 
differentiate what is theirs and what isn't theirs because and we know this for anybody who works with couples around infidelity rarely is infidelity only one-sided sometimes it is sometimes it's only one-sided but oftentimes infidelity has an equal but opposite dynamic where both parties contribute in some way one person shut down the other person acts out or whatever version, right? So I would see about your client's ability to explore their own issues, what they need to heal and forgive themselves for before they could think about forgiving the other person. One of the things that I find so powerful around healing your trauma first before you're open or not to choose to forgive another person is that every time I've done healing relative to being harmed by someone else, once I've healed my own wound, I can see the wound in the other person. Okay, let me give you an example of that. With my father, the more I was able to heal from physical abuse, from verbal abuse, the more I healed my wound, the part of me that held that trauma, I was able to see the wound in my father. It's like, oh my goodness, he is a wounded little boy too. He has his own vulnerabilities. He has his own limitations. But it was only after I healed my own trauma that I was able to see the woundedness in him, because prior to that, my wounded part only was in relationship to his perpetrator part. <clears throat> but once I healed my wounded part, I was able to be in relationship to his wounded part, right? <clears throat> so that's a, an important dimension of looking at that when you've been the recipient of something like that. Now, Anne, I'm going to take your question to one other dimension here, because uh, I've been talking to people more and more about this lately. Is it too hard to heal from sexual violation? Is it even attainable? Is it even realistic to think that someone can heal when they've been sexually violated? What I will say in adult mutual relationships is yes, it's possible. We see this all the we, we do see this a lot with infidelities. We see things um, in adult mutual relationships where there's been a sexual violation in one way or another. Is it possible when a child has been sexually violated by an adult to be able to forgive them? Yes, I believe that is possible. However, however, I don't. I think the person who's a child who's been sexually violated needs to be out of the relationship of parent-child, right? That when somebody is legally responsible for you, has power and control over you, I think the issue is a different story, right? And so I think forgiveness after sexual violation is attainable. But I think there needs to be agency and power within in order to be able to do that. Okay. So thank you for that question. And um then I'm gonna I'll take one other question and then we'll move forward. Um Cynthia asks: when we engage in forgiveness in isolation, we can forgive someone even after they have died. Absolutely, absolutely. I have found that I am assuming I can also free us to grieve without getting stuck in the grief. Yeah, I absolutely, Cynthia, think that it is possible to forgive someone after they have died. Because remember, what I said earlier is we're talking about releasing the feelings that we carry about the other person. That is a dimension of forgiveness that I think is important. Now, again, some religious institutions, some in Christianity 
talk about the person who's harming, asking for forgiveness. That's a different, different dimension of it. But from a psychotherapy perspective, yes, I think we can forgive somebody after they've died because we're the ones releasing what we're carrying. Okay. Um, uh, let, let's take one more and then we'll go and then we'll continue. So Anna says, regarding components of forgiveness, does letting go of anger and resentment mean that when reflecting on it, you will never feel angry? No, I don't think that's true. I, I, I do think it's okay for feelings to come up. And, you know, this brings up an important piece for me around healing trauma, as well as around forgiveness. I don't think it's an on or off switch. I don't think it's one thing or another. I think it's a combination of things, right? I think there's layers of forgiveness. Um, I, I just told you yesterday, I, I have this whole new layer of forgiveness relative to my mom. And I, I let go of a lot of anger and resentment that I carried towards her over the years for being that passive parent and not standing up or protecting me. So I, I had a lot of love for her and I had a lot of forgiveness for her. But there was this new dimension, this new layer of forgiveness that happens that happened yesterday because she was able to acknowledge for the first time in her life, yes, Frankie, you were traumatized growing up. And yes, Frankie, I'm sorry for not protecting you. I wasn't strong enough to stand up to him and protect you. So that was a relational component that added a dimension of, <clears throat> of forgiveness and of healing for us, right? So yeah, it's not like once you forgive somebody, you'll never have negative feelings about it again. Absolutely not. Things show up in our life. I think about healing is never, 100% complete, but layer after layer after layer. So it definitely can happen in my experience anyways. Okay, beautiful. So let's continue. Let's see, I'll share the screen. <clears throat> and then if we think about forgiveness, right? We're wanting to think about um, the different levels of trauma, right? You know what, folks, before we do that, let me... Um, yeah, let me do this. Uh, I'll continue. I'll continue and then I'll do that in a couple of minutes. So when we're thinking about forgiveness, we're thinking about the different levels of trauma, right? What types of trauma warrant what types of forgiveness, right? Because there's different levels and layers, right? We can talk about acute trauma or a single incident event. And what do we need to forgive around that? We talk about chronic trauma or PTSD, things that are more ongoing. We talk about that repeated relational trauma or, or complex PTSD. Huge one around forgiveness is family legacy. There's so much within families that are passed down through the generations. And what are the things we should hold on to relative what our family has passed down to us? And what are the things we can release and let go of because they don't serve us well, <clears throat> that we've incorporated from being in whatever family, from being in whatever ethnicity we've grown up in, institutional or religious trauma. You know, there's a lot of religious or institutional trauma that exists in the world. You know, it's why HR departments are, have been developed, right, in, in regards to organizations or corporations, but there's a lot of harm that's been done in institutions, in organizations. And what's required on that level for forgiveness and healing? What kinds of systemic, this is where systemic comes in. What kind of systemic changes need to happen in order for forgiveness to be um, accomplished in the context or with an organization 
or an institution, right? Again, cultural, sorry, family legacy shouldn't be here, cultural trauma. So much trauma happens in the context of the culture and society we grow up in, especially when we're part of a marginalized community, right? For sure. So what systemic changes need to happen in order for forgiveness to be attainable? Or what can I forgive when I've been the recipient of systemic trauma, right? And can I forgive culturally within the family if there are no systemic changes? Complicated question, right? And then of course, globally, right? Um, <clears throat> how do we deal with the global effects of trauma? The way I like to think of global or systemic issues such as institutional, religious, cultural or family legacy is this. If I think about the whole world, right? And if I'm using some principles of internal family systems here, just for a moment, what is the self of the institution? What is the self of the family? What is the self of the country? What is the self of the world? Where is it located? How is it felt? How is it accessed? Where are the protectors within a family? Where are the protectors within an institution or a community or the world, right? Where are the wounds in a family, in a culture, in a society, in an institution? So we want to look at marginalized communities, whether they're systemically in a culture, in a country, globally, or are we talking about in the context of a family, right? Who are the wounded ones? Who, who are marginalized within the family system? So we wanna look at those on a global scale, on a systemic scale, as well as on an individual scale, because there can be different dimensions of healing. When I forgive the person who, I'm gonna forgive the priest who harmed me or violated me, number one, I'm gonna forgive the institution for ignoring it or supporting him over me. Two different layers, right? <clears throat> so there are a range of responses for all of us. We can repeat it, we can repress it, we can learn from it and we can grow beyond it. And boy, folks, let me just share with you, I'm, I haven't always been in the learn and grow from it phase. You know, I was certainly in a repeat phase for quite a while. I'll tell you this other piece that I mentioned earlier, and I wrote about this in the book To Be Loved also, was, um, <laughs> so I told you that I married a woman because of like doing the right thing and being like a man was supposed to be. I married a woman, I became my father. She was like my mother. And I, I reenacted that, you know, verbal control and abuse cycle in a way that felt horrible. I hated myself for it. There was so much self-loathing and self-criticism, right? So then I came out at age 32. And my first relationship as an out man was with this dominant, controlling man. And I was the passive accommodating partner. So I flipped and I recreated <clears throat> my mom and dad cycle, but on the other side, right? I became passive and accommodating. He was controlling and dominant. And I was like, holy crap, Frank, that didn't work well either. Let me just tell you. So I repeated the other side and I was like, let me tell you, I'm running out of options here. Tried my dad, tried my mom. What the hell am I gonna do? And it wasn't until I really healed enough of my history that I was actually able to choose from a different place within me where I didn't repeat my father's pattern and I didn't repeat my mother's pattern. I chose from a different place, but it took me a long time to not repeat and to not repress it, to learn and grow from it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at resilience here a little bit. Then we're gonna talk about self-energy, then we'll take a break, 15 minute break. 
So the role of resilience, I have to tell you, I've spent a lot of time looking at this subject of resilience because I never fully understood why did I overcome my trauma? Why was I driven to go to therapy? Why, even though I repeated, was I on this constant cycle to approve myself? What was that to get above and beyond what happened to me? It's this issue of resilience. And, you know, I try to think, where do we get it? Are some people just born with it? Can you cultivate resilience? Like what are the elements to it? And I really do truly believe I'm a highly resilient person, but I don't know who made me that way or why I became that way. Maybe it was because I did have one parent, even though she betrayed me by keeping our family in a kind of this environment, I really truly felt loved and special by my mom. So maybe it was because I had that one, at least that one special person. But when I'm looking at resilience, I'm looking at, can the person form a meaningful connection? Can they tolerate uncertainty? Can they be with difficult emotions? This is so hard for so many people. Don't feel sad. Don't feel upset. You shouldn't feel that way. How are we? What is our capacity to be with painful emotions? <clears throat> are we willing or capable of learning from difficult moments? Or do we want to repress them? Can we see the value in someone outside of ourselves? This for me is a very important quality <clears throat> around seeing the other person's point of view. Can we acknowledge our own vulnerability? Some of the people in my experience doing therapy since 1992 is the people that are the most resistant for change are the people that get stuck in blame and can't take responsibility for themselves and their actions. It's one of the most toxic traits in my experience is one's inability to step outside oneself, put oneself in somebody else's shoes, see the situation from another person's point of view. If you can't do that, that really sets things up for a struggle around change. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'm going to say it's much more challenging. <clears throat> can people acknowledge our own vulnerability? And can we take responsibility for our own actions? So these are some of the qualities that I see relative to resilience that contribute to one's capacity for forgiveness, for being able to heal from trauma. <clears throat> um, it's interesting because there was a research study done and I, I looked up some of this, it's not thorough, but <clears throat> there are different parts of the brain that are connected to higher resilience than lower resilience. Just like we know that there are different parts of the brain that are connected to empathy. There are different parts of the brain that are connected to compassion. But there's also parts of the brain, the hippocampus, um, the central executive network, the limbic regions that are connected to this issue of resilience, our capacity to regulate emotions through the prefrontal cortex. Everybody knows down regulation, that contributes to resilience, right? <clears throat> okay. Rick Hansen has a model around resilience that I really like also. And he talks about something that Viktor Frankl talks about. I'm reading that book again, Man's Life for Meaning, um, around agency, around can I help someone else despite my own suffering? Very powerful when we think about resilience, rising above, moving beyond our pain and hurt. Is there something bigger here? I don't want to stay stuck in the singularity of my father hurt me, I'm a victim of him. I want to, I want to, and I'm gratefully capable now 
of seeing life beyond what happened to me relative to him. It's a much bigger issue, right? Can I see beyond my individual experience? However, can I use my individual experience to help the greater purpose? Can I use the individual to help the whole? That is a big piece of what's required in order for forgiveness to occur, right? <clears throat> um, gratitude, confidence, calm, motivation, follow your dreams. <clears throat> Angela Duckworth talks about grit, another word for compassion, uh, for um, resilience. She says resilience can be cultivated, that we can build it. And I love what she says here. Parents can build grit in children by providing warmth, autonomy, support, and demanding. Demanding is not used in a negative context here. Try to do better. I'm going to constantly encourage you. I, I think demanding is the wrong word, honestly. I think when a parent is constantly not doing for you, but saying, you can continue to grow. You can continue to improve. <clears throat> we found, not we, I didn't do the study, but I read a study recently that said, kids who are constantly told they're smart have greater anxiety and internalized shame. Because you're smart, you're smart creates a pressure to live up to and it creates something constantly to fail from. Versus developing grit and competence when we say, you're a hard worker, you're a hard worker. That develops this capacity for kids to say, I'm a hard worker. I could work through this adversity. I'm a hard worker. I could work through this challenge. So it doesn't provide the context of pressure or being um, controlling or feeling shame. Okay, now when we compare resilience from self-energy, we think about this. Sometimes resilience and self-energy are aligned. Self-energy, for those of you who know IFS, don't have to know IFS to know what self-energy is, it's everybody's internal wisdom. It's our core, it's our wisdom, it's our truth, which often gets disconnected in trauma. In order to survive, we need to disconnect from ourselves, connect to the other person for survival purposes, right? So sometimes self-energy, our truth, is aligned with our resilience, our capacity to grow. Sometimes they're contradictory, <clears throat> especially when resilience is cultivated, right? Building it, building it, building it. It can have a drive attached to it that is different than this is who I am naturally, right? So we want to see how resilience and self-energy are aligned and how they are different. They both have the capacity to tolerate and difference and adversity. That's one thing they have in common and moving through something painful. Okay, so why don't we take a 15 minute break now and then we will move forward. We're gonna, I'll read an excerpt from my book. Um, and I'm also gonna talk about different models of forgiveness um, as it relates to healing relational trauma. All right, everyone, thank you so much again for being here. I will see you in 15 minutes.
Hello, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome back. Welcome back. <clears throat> so let's continue here. Um, see if there are a couple more questions. Let's let me start with a couple questions and then we will go from there. Okay. Ah, really good question by Christine. What happens if abuse is ongoing? <clears throat> you know, Christine, that's a great question. And, and what I will say is I don't think healing or forgiveness should be done when abuse is ongoing, okay? And this is one of the complicated things that I mentioned earlier relative to children, right? When kids are actively, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when kids are actively in an abusive situation, or adults for that matter are actively in an abusive situation, I think that forgiveness or healing shouldn't be done. There's too much vulnerability <clears throat> that we have to access and tap into. And I think it's not um, in anyone's best interest to do that when active abuse is happening. I think it's best to get yourself out of harm's way, get into a safe situation, and then <clears throat> think about healing and or forgiveness. So thank you for that question. Debbie says, Debbie Walker says, how does one get through the thoughts of what could have been or what is? Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you, Debbie, for that. What I could have been if X did not happen and how does one forgive themselves? <clears throat> Is this a choice in recovery? So two really important questions here. The first one has to do with grief. And the second one has to do with healing. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Got something stuck in my throat. <clears throat> so Debbie. <clears throat> One of the big hallmark components to the end stage of healing relational trauma is, is loss and memory and grief. Like, <clears throat> wow, my life could have been so much different had I not been in this family. My life would have been so much different had I had not chosen this person <clears throat> as a partner, right? And that is an important component to healing. Once you've released what you're carrying, thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations around a trauma, then you wanna think about the grief and the loss, the years lost <clears throat> relative to um, what could have been. That's a normal part of the healing process. So I think it's about staying with the feelings, don't rush the process, and don't push it through, but allow that sadness to be acknowledged because it's true. In my experience personally, like, you know, someone, <clears throat> I came out at 32 years of age. And I told you earlier, I had, you know, was in this kind of suppressive conversion therapy as a kid. I was taught to not be myself for many, many years and I was a good student. So I listened to all the things and did all the right things. I was, I had 32 years of not being myself, right? And was there loss attached to that? 100%. Did I see and feel the way people in my family, my brothers, <clears throat> my friends were able to move on in their life in a way that I wasn't? 100%. One of the things that was the most striking for me, and I write about this in To Be Loved, was I was 32 when I came out. <clears throat> All my contemporaries were like married, raising children, <clears throat> do, living their lives, traveling the world, all this kind of stuff. I was like an adolescent, like developmentally, because I had missed so much. I was like a teenage kid. I was like having a real relationship for the first time in my life. I was dating people in a way that a, a sophomore in high school should have dated. I was put dressing, I swear to God, 
<clears throat> I got rid of my beard. I got rid of my suits and ties. I was living this fake life, right? This Harvard professor fake life. Once I came out and I started becoming myself, I dressed actually the way I wanted to dress for the first time in my life, not the way I was supposed to dress. So I kind of felt silly being like a 32 year old adolescent. <clears throat> I went out to bars and I was dancing and, you know, drinking and not a lot of drinking. I've never been a big drinker, but I was partying. I never even did any of that stuff. So there was making up for lost time, but there was a sadness around, wow, you missed a lot here, Frank. The, however, the thing that I will say that counteracted it for me, and I wasn't forcing this, it happened more natural and organically, was <clears throat> there was so much more to look forward to finally being me. That even though I felt the loss, it didn't dominate me. It didn't take over my life because there was so much <clears throat> new happening to me. I'll, I'll tell you this quote, and honestly, <clears throat> it it I just it brought me to tears when someone who read an early version of, of early copy of the book said, I, he said, Frank, would you mind if I get this tattooed on my arm? It's like, what are you talking about? He said, there's a line in your book that I can't get out of my head. I, I wanted nothing more than to have people relate to this issue of forgiveness, relate to this issue of healing trauma. So for him to say he wanted to have this statement tattooed on his arm was like life change, was brilliant for me, beautiful. He said, when I was talking to my wife, when we were ending our relationship, when we were getting divorced, she said to me, Frank, why did you need to run away from me so fastly and so extremely when we got separated? <laughs> After eight years of marriage, by the way. And I just said to her spontaneously from my heart, oh, oh honey, I'm not, I, I was never running away from you. I was running toward me. And that was the line that this person wanted a tattoo right on them. And that was what it was for me. I wasn't running away from her. I wasn't running away from my life. I was moving toward me for the first time in my life, right? So we, even though sadness is there, the more you release of what you're carrying that doesn't belong to you, the more you're able to move towards something that's rich and filling, aligned and feels good. So feel those feelings and move forward. Now, this issue of how does one forgive themselves? I'm gonna dive in here um, for a moment because this is a really important piece that I wanna share with people. Um, as we talk about the different types of forgiveness, as we talk about the different models and how one forgives, I wanna mention this, Debbie, because you asked me this question now. And this was something, folks, that I absolutely was struck by. I had no clue that this is how it would have gone. <clears throat> Once I was able to forgive my father and you will, hear about at the end of his life, he said something to me that was so powerful and profound. It <clears throat> catapulted me into a whole new level of forgiveness. Okay. It allowed me to feel love from and for him in the first time in my life. This was two years ago. What I was aware of, and I was shocked, is that <clears throat> receiving love from someone who harmed you and being healed enough and open enough to receive it 
I just get emotional just saying this, enabled me to feel love for him. Receiving love from someone who harmed me, having the capacity to take it in. Now, he had to have the capacity to give it to me. I had to have the capacity to receive it, which was all my own trauma work. Enabled me to feel love for him. And I will say, folks, for, so far, there are a, a handful of things that are standouts in our life, right? We all have moments <clears throat> that are standout moments. Loving someone who harmed me has been one of the most freeing experiences I have had in my life. To truly love someone who's harmed you shows the freedom, the lack of tethering, the no longer tied to this person in a traumatic way. You are connected to them at a different vibration, no longer a connection of trauma and betrayal and hurt and violation, but you rise above the trauma and you're connected through love. That is freeing and powerful to no longer be affected by what has happened to you. And that was for me. <clears throat> and I felt that so powerfully. Um, and I don't even know that my dad was aware of that. That was all my own experience. He probably was, he probably felt the love from me in a way I would say that's probably true. So this idea of loving someone who harmed you, truly being able to be free of it, no longer being tethered by trauma, then enabled me to forgive myself. It was only then that I was able to forgive myself for the ways that I have harmed others. And again, this was a total surprise for me. I was not expecting this. I was very critical of myself every time I had a bad parenting moment. I'm like, damn it, Frank, you're, you're a psychiatrist, you're a therapist, you know what healthy is. You do it for a living. You teach people on a daily basis and every time I would yell or lose it with my kids. I'd have such self-loathing. You know, how could you do the very thing that was done to you? Painful for any trauma survivor to do the thing that was done to them. And I did that with my children. I did. I became a version of a perpetrator to them in the way that I was perpetrated upon. Not to the same degree, but enough to make me hate myself, enough to make me hate myself. And it was only after loving him, freeing myself of the trauma bond between him and I, that I started forgiving myself. I'm like, Frank, you are doing your best. You are not your father. And I was able to apologize so much easier. I am sorry for harming you kids. I am sorry for what I've done to you. Yes, I understand that I wasn't perfect. It was, it was a remarkable series of connections that I had never expected. And I want everybody to know that may not be the automatic way it happens for you. It may have a different order for you in your healing journey or for your clients for that matter. But please do know that that's possible, right? And that if you choose forgiveness, if you choose to repair and untether the trauma bond, you can relate on a different level. You can have a different relationship with someone who harmed you, even if they can't have that same relationship with you. And it frees you up to stop judging yourself and to open yourself 
to forgive yourself. You know, we are all, we have all been harmed and we all harm. And if you're out there and you say you've never harmed anybody, let's have a conversation because I don't believe it. I think we've all done both. And I think the only way we can rise above it, connect in a way outside of our trauma is to move through this process of healing trauma and to move through this process of forgiveness. Okay. I wasn't expecting it. It's what I experienced. And again, different people are going to have their own journeys. I've worked with several people since this happened with me who have come to me because of working around forgiveness with people who have died, for example, and the process of helping them <clears throat> go through the forgiveness journey when the other person is no longer on this earth is, is doable, you know, based on what I've experienced. So thank you for that question, Debbie. I really do appreciate the forgiving ourselves is just as important, if not more important than the process of forgiving someone who harmed us. But how are we going to forgive ourselves when we've internalized perpetrator energy? We all do. And how do we forgive ourselves when we're acting like someone who's harmed us and we can't forgive them? Right? I think about these things, love, connection, and unity. And the unity piece, folks, is something around crossing the divide, crossing the divide between the us and them, the perpetrator, the victim, the blue side, the red side, whatever divide you want to get into. <clears throat> There's a process, I believe, of love, acceptance, connection, forgiveness on both sides that needs to happen in order for us to rise above it. Okay, um, let's move on. Thank you for that question. Um, all right, somebody's asking about some steps. So I wanna give you some steps as we move forward here. All right, let's look at <clears throat> comparing, resi we, we talked about resilience and self-energy and you know, resilience can have a driven quality to it. And when resilience is driven, when resilience has an energy of striving, it's different than self-energy because self-energy has love and acceptance. Resilience is working through hard. So sometimes they're aligned, sometimes they're different. Both are important. <clears throat> and I already talked about this self-energy, our internal wisdom, our souls, our capacity for healing, our connection to source. When we're in a place of love and compassion, we have more capacity for forgiveness. We don't forgive from a place of I should, or I have to, or I can only receive love if I forgive, if there's conditions attached to it it's not gonna be authentic or lasting, right? It's when forgiveness comes from free will, when forgiveness comes from a place of love, it has a whole different quality attached to it. Okay, let me move into, hold on one second. I just wanna move into the, these different steps here. <clears throat> All right. When we think about forgiveness, when we think about healing, and you know, I mentioned that piece, whoop, you're not seeing this slide, I didn't share it, sorry about that, sorry. I'm talking with the next slide up and you haven't seen that next slide yet. When we talk about forgiveness, when we talk about healing, um, we look at energy. Remember a couple moments ago, I talked about this uh, being attached, unconnected to someone relative to trauma, trauma bond. In order to rise above the trauma bond, we're talking about 
being at a different a level of energy. Trauma is absorbing an energy that's harmful, that's negative, that's neglect rooted, rooted that's <clears throat> connected to violation, right? That's trauma energy, okay? We don't want to live there. We want to release our trauma energy and elevate ourselves to a, an energy of love and compassion, right? And so when we're thinking about forgiveness, when we're thinking about healing, we want to think about acknowledging the, the trauma energy, going through the process of healing that, and then interacting in the world from a different energy vibration, right? There's an intersection of energy in every interaction we have, whether we're out in nature, whether we're having a relationship with somebody, whether we're connecting spiritually, right? There's whether we're with a baby, newborn baby, whether we're making love, like those are all energy exchanges. And when we've been in overwhelming experiences, we absorb that energy, right? And we carry perceptions about it. And we get confused around what is ours and what is theirs. What should we carry? What shouldn't we carry? I believe that we're all holding around a lot of energy that really isn't ours and doesn't belong to us and weights us down. I really feel that way. And the more you can release the energy that doesn't belong to you, that weighs you down, the more you're going to be able to relate to anybody, regardless of the place that they're in, from a loving place. <clears throat> we don't need to carry what's not ours. Now, how do we get wounded? How do we heal? I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to spend the rest of our time, we have 30 minutes left now, talking about the different the different kinds of forgiveness models, right? So we're going to end here with healing. What do you mean by healing trauma, Frank? What does that mean? And what do you mean by forgiveness? What are the steps of forgiveness? So we're going to get a little practical here as we move into the end of our time together in this way. So I think about us getting hurt. I think about vulnerability. And I think our wounding is a distortion of responsibility around our vulnerability. So I think, I'm gonna say that again, I think our wounding is a distortion around responsibility of our vulnerable selves. And let me break that down to you and let me show you, share with you a little bit more about what I mean by that. <clears throat> I think vulnerability is when we connect to what we feel and when we share it with someone, okay? I told you I was a little boy and I got I the first chapter of this book. I was a little boy. I got caught playing with a Barbie doll in my cousin's basement. <clears throat> I was interested, I was actually playing with the Barbie Playhouse, if you want to know the truth. And I was like so intrigued by the, the little bed and the little toilet and the, the miniature house. I was like, oh my God, this is so cool, right? But don't play with the, Frankie, get out of there. Boys aren't supposed to play with dolls, right? There was this reaction and I don't even know who it was who reacted that way to tell you the truth. I couldn't even tell you who it was so many years later. I was six years old. But I was being my authentic self and somebody else reacted to me. So it was the reaction of the other that caused the wound in me. Because when I heard that harsh tone and critical voice, I, was, I immediately said, oh my God, I'm bad, I'm wrong, I shouldn't do this. Right. So I was being my authentic, curious self, but the other person's reaction, I internalized and that created a shame wound. It created a profound shame wound as I'm wrong, I'm bad. 
but it's the distortion of somebody else's response as a po that I internalized that created the wound. <clears throat> when I think about the components of healing, I think there are key steps to this, okay? Regardless of whether you're a therapist or not, regardless of whether you are someone who um, is out there doing your own healing journey or you're helping other people heal, I think there's a sharing, a disconfirming or a corrective experience, a release, and then moving forward. So for me, healing trauma has these components attached to it share the experience that little boy frankie shared with me and my therapist what it was like for him in that moment okay then once the sharing and it's not just the story folks it's the thoughts the feelings and the physical sensation then there's a corrective experience that needs to happen. That little boy felt loved and seen by me and my therapist. There's nothing wrong with you. You did nothing wrong. You are good just the way you are. A corrective experience. Then release is possible. Then that little boy doesn't have to carry the shame of somebody else's comment any longer. And then there's a capacity to move forward. So here's what I think needs to happen when we hold trauma. We share the whole experience, not just the story, thoughts, feelings, physical sensations. We have a corrective experience relationally or individually, internally. Remember we said that healing can happen in isolation, it doesn't have to be relational, but it can be. Then release is possible once that happens. Then we could move forward and choose, move forward and choose forgiveness around the person who harmed us if we want to. Okay? <laughs> this is what I call the arc of healing. And this is connected to internal family systems, as many people know, um, creating that I work with, creating a safe, creating safety and establishing boundaries, identifying and being with the parts of you that are trying to protect you, embrace the positive intention of all parts, access compassion and empathy. Gain permission to be with the pain. Allow wounds to share what they're holding. Provide a corrective experience. Release painful experiences and then align inside and out. Now, as we talk about <clears throat> forgiveness after healing, I wanna read an excerpt of my, uh, uh, just a small excerpt here to show you a bit of my process of healing, right? And again, remember I talked about it being in stages and going in stages. So I wanna just read this little excerpt to you. And this, was a, this is an excerpt that shows pieces of my transformation of moving from anger and resentment to love and compassion. Right. So I want to just share it with you so that you can get a sense of my journey, because, again, it doesn't happen all at once. And it's a process cumulatively over time for all of us. Right. Along with enjoying my kids, my father engaged in a conversation with my husband. During one of their cordial chats, when I overheard my father it was clear that the narcotic pain medications he had been taking, some prescribed by a doctor, some not, were affecting his cognitive functioning. Michael, it's so nice to finally get to know you. You're my kind of person. What a relief. Michael fell into the good people category. Thank you, Lewis, said Michael, 
not mentioning the fact that they had known each other for over 22 years by that time. You know, I've saved a lot of money over the years in my career as a pharmacist, my dad continued. I've been thinking that it makes sense to leave more money to my girls. They've been so good to me. They're always coming over, constantly bringing me things to eat, and doing stuff for me around the house. It's the only logical thing to do. Well, Lewis, it's your money after all, Michael said. You can do whatever you want with it. Overhearing this, I bit my tongue. You son of a bitch. You still want to try and control us from the grave. You're just like your father, cutting his son out of the will for getting divorced. Once again, he was showing favoritism in the family, just like he had done when we were kids. But then, much to my surprise, my mindset shifted and a sense of calm took over my body. I'm not gonna let this consume me and I'm not gonna let this ruin our trip together. Let my sisters have the money. They do do so much for my parents. I'm happy for them. The work in therapy was finally paying off. I was done carrying around anger and resentment towards my father. It was important to momentarily acknowledge what I had felt, but it was even <clears throat> better not to hold on to it any longer. The freedom of letting go is intoxicating. During our, visit with my, during our visit, my husband and I slept in my childhood bedroom. The room remained remarkably unchanged. The red, white, and blue soldier wallpaper, the dressers, the bookshelves crowded with trophies and pictures of our childhood. Even the hinges on the push button door and the lock, even the hinges and the push button lock on the door remained the same. The only difference was that <clears throat> the twin beds had been replaced by a king size bed and Grandma Florida's favorite rocking chair sat in the center of the room. But during this visit, I didn't have any flashbacks or nightmares. I didn't wet the bed. I didn't even feel hatred towards my father. Instead, after Michael and I reviewed the events of the day, I cuddled up next to him and peacefully drifted off to sleep. So I just wanted to read an excerpt to, to you to show you my process. It was the first time I had that anger rise up and then this moment of letting go. And those moments accumulated for me, right? This was after many years of therapy. This was after going through much of my history around what had happened to me, releasing the pain about being physically abused, emotionally abused, dealing with the stuff around my mother for accommodating and tolerating way too much. So yes, I had that initial surge of anger and resentment, and then it shifted. And it was this oh, aha moment for me. And I was able to let go of that anger and resentment and it felt so good. I'm gonna read one other <clears throat> segment. <clears throat> And this is a second piece around my process of forgiven. This was a second trip after going back to help care for my father while he was ill. <clears throat> my simply being there with my dad, caring for him, sitting together to eat or talk seemed to breathe new life into his fragile mind and body. Was my presence important to him? Did he actually like having me around? Or did he just need somebody 
<clears throat> to come in and take charge instead of letting him run the show as my mom and sisters were accustomed to doing. It didn't matter. It was working and it felt good. That said, <clears throat> it wasn't easy for me. Come on, dad, it's time to drink something. Just a few sips, I encouraged him. No more diet Pepsi. Caffeine-free Pepsi is much better for you. It has more calories and it doesn't have any caffeine which is dehydrating. What he really needs to be drinking is a protein shake, not soda, I thought, but we'll address that tomorrow. Okay, if you say so, Frankie. He managed to take two sips, then shook his head and sat back. Since my father hadn't bathed since he was released from the hospital three weeks earlier, my mom asked me to help him take a shower. Putting the strap around his waist, I helped him walk back up the stairs and led him into the bathroom. Come on, dad, it's time to take a shower, I said. I'll help you take your clothes off. Okay, Frank, he replied. The image of this old tiny man hunched over with multiple scars down the entire length of his back, his shrunken butt and sagging skin will forever be etched in my mind. I helped him get into the shower as he sat in his plastic hospital chair that my mom purchased a few months prior. He proceeded to give me instructions on how to bathe him. The shampoo needs to go on first, he said. Then we'll need to wash from the top down, face first, then body, last the legs. This way we won't get any dirt on the areas that are already clean. Okay, Dad, I said calmly, calmly, we can wash in whatever way you want to. We need more soap on that washcloth. It needs to be really soapy, he instructed, and make sure you wash between each one of my toes when you get to my feet. I sure will. As I washed my dad, images of little Frankie flashed before my mind. A full circle moment, I thought. I used to spend hours in this bathroom with my mom, who would sometimes be just in a bra and underwear, helping her with her hair, her makeup, and outfit choices. Now I was back here, some 50 years later, helping my father undress and take a shower. I didn't want to be here back then, and I didn't want to be here now, but for entirely different reasons, I couldn't say no to either one of them. That moment was the first moment I felt compassion for my father. It was a full circle moment for me. The passage I read earlier was <clears throat> this time that I was able to let go of anger and resentment. And then this time of having to bathe him and seeing his old fragile body was this moment of compassion for him. And I will tell you, I don't think any of that would have been possible had I not done the work I just talked about in healing my own trauma. I was open and available to start feeling things for him that were different than I had ever felt before. The feeling toward the perpetrator is the process of forgiveness, right? So now let us finish here in our last time and talk about those steps. And I want to specifically share, as I mentioned earlier, Desmond Tutu's process of forgiveness. <clears throat> Desmond Tutu talks about forgiveness after healing. Oh, hold on a second. It's ineffective it's as if it's premature. We, I recommend we wait until the wound is healed. We release what we carry around the trauma before we're going to release what we carry around the other person. Forgiveness is primarily between the self 
and the wound when we're talking about healing the trauma forgiveness is primarily between the self and the perpetrator when we're talking about he healing in relationship to the other self to wound healing trauma self to perpetrator forgiveness <clears throat> What, where are we here? Okay. Desmond Tutu, as I talked about, talked about truth um, and reconciliation. Um, we all have, he said, we all have painful experiences in life and we all have control over our response to them. And I just love this. We don't have control over what happens to us we have control of how we respond. And I would add to ourselves as well as to those who have hurt us. We can choose revenge or forgiveness. Forgiveness is often seen as weak, saintly, soft, not having accountability. However, it sets us free. Desmond Tutu and I hold the same belief. I can't even believe I'm making a statement like that, like, hello, but I mean this in this way, no act that can't be forgiven. This is somebody who's looked at horrific things that have happened in the world. And for him to say, no act can't be forgiven is a powerful statement. I happen to believe that also. No person is unworthy of forgiveness. Now that may challenge some of you out there, but I will share that I hold this truth. We often need to forgive ourselves for what we have done. <clears throat> First, the steps of forgiveness, the fourfold past path to forgiveness tell your story research shows that children are more resilient when they know their family stories <clears throat> there is a right and a wrong time to tell your story i believe tell your story after healing there's a meditative process here that he uses in each step Tell a close friend, put the words in a box, close the box, hand the box to a friend. This can be done literally or in your imagination within your mind. The next step is identify where it hurts. Separate facts from feelings name the feelings. I will say, be with your emotions. Naming the hurt allows for vulnerability. Here is where grief is common. Here is where people have grief around the acknowledgement of what happened to them. His motivation, his meditation here is put your hand on your heart and put another hand on your stomach and breathe into the feelings, share it, have a friend validate your feelings and then leave the room, okay? Acknowledge, feel, share, disconnect from it. Don't jump ahead and disconnect from it. It's important to go through those steps first. The third step, consciously choose to forgive. It's a practice and it takes time. Identify your motivation. Very important here, folks. Are you doing this for you or are you doing this for the other person? Are you doing this to free yourself from feeling victim? If so, Go back to do the healing work before the forgiveness work. 
allow for agency and choice, connect to your grit, to your power, to your agency. <clears throat> I'm the cause, not the effect, right? I can make this happen. I can choose to forgive coming from an empowering place, not from a victim place. Seeing the humanity in the perpetrator, this is what in reading my last excerpt, I shared with you around my father. Seeing the humanity in the perpetrator, this is key. Once we can see the humanity in our perpetrators, we then, as I explained earlier, have the capacity to see the perpetrator and humanity within ourselves. We are all complicated humans. Bring in a positive emotion. Picture the person you want to forgive as a child or a baby. Send good feelings towards them. Do you see how this is so important around timing? Because if you did this too early on in your healing journey, it wouldn't be authentic and it wouldn't stick. The last step in the last stage here is release or renewing the relationship. You want to choose whether you want to keep this person in your life or send them away and free them from the trauma bind, from the trauma bonds. Renewing is not restoring what previously was. This happens all the time in cases of reconciliation around infidelity. You're creating a new way of being with this person. You're creating a new kind of connection. What do you need from them in order to heal? Very important. Do you need to share your experience? Do you need something from them? Be careful if you need something from them, it may or may not happen, but if they're receptive, it may be important to share that. Listen to your pain. <clears throat> Explain why they did it. Pay restitution or make amends. You have choices here, okay? Asking for what you need is so powerful in the confines of doing it with someone who has harmed you. Remember, we're doing it from a place of calm power, from a place of confidence, not from a place of woundedness or victimhood, because that has been healed already. If they can meet it, you it could contribute to a renewal, to a new relationship with them. If they can't, you can choose to release them. The meditation here is with a trusted person. Think about the person you're forgiving. Feel the feelings about the relationship. Share it with your friend. What choice feels authentic to you, and then leave the room, okay? This is one model of forgiveness that I personally like. This is separate from healing the trauma. So think about these stages. These are not the only stages of forgiveness. This is one such model. Jack Cornfield has his model of forgiveness. <clears throat> and religious institutions have theirs. Jack Cornfield says it's a process, not achieve a one and go, a practice that requires a conscious effort and a loving heart. It's not forgetting, it's acknowledging the hurt and the pain and letting go of the resentment and the anger. It's not condoning. It is letting go of the suffering and releasing the burden. Loving kindness is key. 
towards ourselves and others. It is a gift to ourselves, not just an act of kindness towards other. It's freeing ourselves from the burden and living a more peaceful and fulfilling life. It's a process, not a one-time event, and it happens over time. A willingness to keep on practicing. So I just want to say to everyone before we close, thank you so much for being here with me. Honestly, my heart is open. I do believe that this is possible. I think every one of us can do this. I think we can teach people to do this. I think it's possible. I think it's achievable. And I don't think we do this in isolation. I think we do this together. So please join me and think about what in your life are you still holding on to? Who in your life are you open to forgiving? And what healing work do you need to do first before you can forgive? I do believe that we can change the ailing that's happening in the world by choosing to release the trauma bonds we carry and taking that next step in choosing to forgive those who have harmed us because we benefit from that and the world globally benefits from that because each negative energetic interaction we release there is better capacity for the world to move forward in a loving peaceful way so thank you again so much for being here if you're interested in your to be loved journey i would love to hear about that i think we all have our own to be loved journey and I think we're going to be able to do this together. So thank you so much and have a beautiful day.